Oh God, it's just an amazing reality that you chose to come to this world to, to live among us, that you wanted us to be your people, that you wanted to live in and through our lives, that our hearts, Father, would actually beat. Our hearts would be moved. And our hearts would be drawn to you. That you are a God who didn't want to leave us lost in our sin, struggling to make our way through life, but instead you are a God who came to show us how we can have redemption from our sins and how we can live our lives, this earth as well as life eternal. And Father, we proclaim your glory among the nations today. For you came and was born. And we celebrate your birth. But you came that you may die. Paying the penalty for our sins. And we acknowledge your death. But you rose from the grave. And you live today. Proving your power over sin and death. And Father, we worship you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And grab your Bibles if you would. And uh, make your way to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter Two, if you don't have your own Bible this morning and would like to, there perhaps should be a red Bible underneath one of the chairs in front of you, and you could turn to page 681, and you'll find Matthew chapter 2 there. <clears throat> Our scripture will be read uh, creatively to us uh, in a few moments. The Bible tells us about a man whose name is Moses. God had chosen Moses to lead his people, the Israelites, out of captivity in Egypt and into the new promised land. However, Moses quickly discovered in leading God's people that it was not easy. In fact, he found it quite difficult. There was rebellion. There was dissension. There was immorality. There was idol worship among the people. And at one point, Moses was crying out to God. He reached a point we wasn't even sure if God was still leading him. Have, have you ever felt like that in your own life? Have you ever gotten to a point to where you're not sure if God's leading you anymore? You're not even sure if God's there. Maybe, maybe something's happened in your life. Maybe you did something and you feel like what you did was so bad or so disappointing to God that he, he no longer wants to really involve you in his day-to-day -day life. Or maybe the devil's convinced you of that and made you feel as if you're not worthy. Or perhaps you've been convinced that he's some cosmic kind of God who set it all into motion, but, but he's not really involved in our day-to-day -day world. I want you to see in today's message that our God is very much involved in our day-to-day -day world. We see that all throughout Scripture. And many of us in this room have experienced it in our own lives as well. But I ask you this as I begin, are you in need of some direction from God? Are you at a point in your own life where you're kind of crying out for some sign from God? You, you just want to know that he's still there and he's still guiding. Moses so desired more of God that he cried out in Exodus chapter 33. He said, he said now show me your glory. What a bold prayer Moses was asking of God. He was wanting more knowledge of God. He was wanting more intimacy with God. He was wanting to have more and more God in his life guiding him. And God responds to Moses in Exodus 33, 19. He says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Just Capture that, if you will, for just a moment. This is speaking of the holiness of God. He is so holy that no person can actually see the fullness of his glory. 
Just as you could not possibly step foot on the surface of the sun, you could not handle the full disclosure, the fullness of God's glory directly from him. And so God is, is protecting Moses in this moment. But then he goes on to say in verse 21, it says, Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. The glory of God, His holiness. Years later, the prophet Isaiah would proclaim, In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of God will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, even though... The prophet Isaiah does not specifically mention Jesus' name here. He is referring to the very birth of Jesus. Jesus as being the glory of God. Years later, John the Baptist would repeat Isaiah's prophecy. In Luke 3, we see, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all mankind will see God's salvation. The birth of Jesus is an unparalleled revelation of the glory of God. Christmas is the glory of God among us. The Apostle John would testify such truth in John 1. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is the manifest glory of God among us. If you have met Jesus, you have seen the glory of God. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of God. Christ. We no longer have to cry out as Moses did, oh God, show me your glory. We have the person of Jesus among us, the glory of Christmas. Christmas is the glory of God among us. And two weeks ago in this series, as I began it, I showed you that God revealed his glory in, in the way in which he came into this world. Jesus left the splendor of heaven and he took on a human form, being born as a baby. We consider the miracle uh, virgin birth and the importance of believing in that as being true. I share with you that God is not bound by the laws of nature. When God created, he set certain laws of nature in, in place in order to keep everything in order. But he himself is, is, is more powerful. He's able to supersede those laws, if you would. So for the Holy Spirit to cause a young virgin to conceive, that is possible for God. And last week I showed you how God revealed his glory through the timing of the birth of Jesus. His sovereignty is seen in in everything from the the day, the the location, and even the people involved, even the innkeeper, who remains nameless to this day. We know very little about it all. Yet God used that individual in a significant way because he made space or made room available for Mary and Joseph and where Jesus was actually born. So God is sovereignly, the scripture said there in that, that passage we looked at last week, that it, when it was a time, it was all God's timing, in other words. And today, I want you to see how God reveals his glory and how the people responded at the birth of Jesus that day, but also how people are responding to the birth of Jesus still today. And to be able to kind of help you see the power of this passage We have gone great distance and length to bring to you descendants of the original wise men to come and share this story personally. Would you welcome them this morning?
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born for the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judah, Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will, who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they, gave, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Yes, it is true. Wise men are born with beards. <laughs> Let me share with you a couple of things from this passage that they have shared with us this morning. First is this. If you are willing to follow him, God will guide you through life. If you are willing to follow him, God will guide you through life. Verse 2 tells us that the magi, or wise men, they had told Herod that they had seen this star in the east. And verse 9 says that this star guided them or directed them right to where Jesus was. Now, some scholars want to argue on what this actual star was. Was it some kind of supernova? Was it Halley's Comet coming by at a scheduled time? Was it a joining of, of Saturn and, and Jupiter and creating a, a more brilliant light at the, at the time? What Scripture says about it is his star was in the east. It's possible God, not being bound by the laws of nature, simply placed a star in the sky at that particular point for that particular purpose. He can do that. Remember, he is God. Whatever it was, it was a miracle because not only did it, did it appear, not only did the wise men see it, but, but it guided them. It, 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 it took them to the actual place where Jesus was. Isaiah 58, 11 tells us, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And Isaiah 58, 11 says, the Lord will guide you always. We see in the story in the Old Testament of Moses that God led Moses and the people of Israel. We see in the New Testament that God led the wise men to Jesus. And we see it still today that God continues to lead people. If you're willing to follow him, he will guide you through this life. But I also want to point out that Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth. Jesus came to bring peace with God. Jesus came to bring peace with God. What happens in verse 3? Look at verse 3. It says that King Herod was disturbed by the news of this new king. King Herod, or as the Romans called him, Herod the Great, he ruled all of Palestine during the years leading up to and shortly after the birth of Jesus. He was born into a, a royal family. He had an enormous amount of, of possessions and power. But he also had an enormous amount of paranoia. He lived daily with a fear 
that he would lose his possession and his power. I fear that perhaps there's people living today and, and every day you too are worried about losing something. You're worried about life falling apart and you're worried about something that come along and just suddenly robbing you of, of what you have in life. And the reality is, even if that happens, God is still there and he's still guiding. But this king... He saw the birth of uh, this new king as being a threat to him. That, very, that question the wise men asked him, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? It really shook Herod to the core, if you would. In fact, the, the word that, that the NIV uh, translates as disturbed actually means to shake violently. And under a pretense of worshiping this new king, Herod set out to discover, to find out where this king was born. And divinely, God, through a dream, warned these wise men not to go back and to reveal such information to Herod. And that infuriated him so much that later on in verse 16, the children didn't read that far, the, the, the king ultimately ordered the execution under, of all those males under the age of two. A horrible thought to consider, especially at Christmas. When we think about all is calm, we sing such songs and we think about the peace and the beauty of the season. But the reality is, ever since Genesis chapter 3, God has had an enemy that has sought to destroy and keep Jesus from coming and being the new king. And so we see once again, in Scripture, through this story, the reality of the spiritual battle that goes on and still wages today between, between God and God's enemy, Satan. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, he said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There's so much in those verses there. The main point is that Jesus coming to this earth didn't just create a separation in time, meaning before Christ and after Christ, but also created a separation or a division, if you would, between people those who follow him and those who do not. Those who consider him worthy to worship, those who do not consider him worthy to be worshipped. Those who are willing to, uh, uh, those who desire to save their own life versus those who are willing to deny their life for his sake. So Jesus didn't come to our world to bring the kind of peace that would merely gloss over the deep differences just for the sake of some type of superficial harmony. He came in order to rescue, to rescue us. People who, as, as the Word of God says, we were enemies with God. We were opposed to God. And that's why He came, to save people, to not bring peace on earth, but to bring peace between people and God. Jesus says there will be conflicts, there will be disagreements between people who choose to follow him and those who do not, and we see that happening still today among family members. Oftentimes these differences are, are portrayed as being a difference of philosophy or a difference of opinion, but deep down, oftentimes it's a difference of who is truly Lord of their hearts and their lives. But if you noticed in the text, it wasn't just Herod that was disturbed of this news of a new king. 
It said even that the religious leaders were disturbed as well. Why would they be disturbed? Were they waiting for this Messiah to come? Yes. But the religious leaders not only were waiting, but had believed that this new king, this Messiah, would come in a particular fashion. They believed him to come in in some kind of royal fashion. They believed that he would come in some type of of a flashy way. That there be no doubt what's happening. And they believed that he would come and set things right, right according to their perceptions. But it didn't happen that way. And since they heard this news of this new king coming, and, and none, of, none of the information which they were receiving made any sense to them, they, they considered the event to be insignificant. And oh, how wrong they were. I want to ask you, do you sometimes get disturbed by the way things play out in your life? Do you sometimes find yourself upset because circumstances have have turned a a particular way and it wasn't what you had planned? In spite of the fact of your desire sometimes to to do the right things, sometimes things happen. And your life has been given a twist Maybe you're not even sure how life is going to work out for you. You're you're, you're struggling to to kind of figure out, kind of like I said earlier, right now you're just wanting to know if God is even there. Is is God still guiding you? But when we think our life should be a certain way, when we anticipate our life to be a certain way, and it doesn't go that way, then we also become disturbed, if you would, even angry, angry. We hold a a hurt that we've experienced. We hold it against God. We experience some type of a loss in our life, and we we get angry with God. We spend so much of our lives looking for, anticipating, hoping that someone or something will come into our lives that will just change everything and make it for the better. We're waiting for the, 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 the superhero to arrive on the scene that will set everything right, that will make all those people who have ever hurt you, that will make them pay, that will make all of your pain go away, that will, that will make all of the justices sim- simply fall right into line. If you're a college football fan, you've got to love the next couple of weeks. 37 individual bowl games. If they could just add a few more, every team gets to go to a bowl game. That's not even counting the three championship series games for a total of 40. Half of those teams will lose. When you consider the other teams that didn't even get to a bowl game because they're losing season, The majority of football teams will lose. But yet, at the end of a season, there will be one team who will be crowned champion while all the rest of the teams collectively cry out, you wait until next year. I mean, even the fans get involved with that. There's this anticipation that next year there will be this new recruiting team coming in. There will be this uh, new set of rookies, maybe maybe even a particular star that will take our team to a a new level and we will win. Every team is taught that. Every coach stands before their team and tells them, you're going to have a a winning season. There's this anticipation. There's this expectation that's happening. But it's not just in sports. It's happening in the business world. We're anticipating just one more client, just the right client. Oh, if I could just make one more deal. If I could just make this sale. Or we're anticipating in relationships. If I could just find the perfect mate. Too late. She's already taken. I got her. Uh, Y'all tell her I said that. She's not here this morning. But are we? We're anticipating that. We're we're anticipating something. Just one more thing happened in your life. We're we're anticipating winning that lottery. Not me, but something more. I don't know what y'all think I'm buying them. 
We're anticipating something happening, a windfall of of finances coming in, and and it's just going to change your life. Everything's going to be set right. But when it doesn't happen that way, what happens? Our dreams, our hopes, all of it's been dashed. But we're constantly waiting. We're expecting. Let me ask you, what is it or who is it that you have placed in your hopes and dreams on lately? If you've been waiting for the next sale, the a new windfall of, uh, 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 of uh, finances or, or some athlete or client or something like that to come into your life, you're likely going to be disappointed. But hear this. When a person faithfully searches for truth, God will lead them to the truth. So if you set your expectation, if you set your anticipation if you set your hopes and your dreams on knowing and experiencing the truth then you will not be disappointed because God will lead you to the truth these wise men they saw this star they recognized it as something spectacular and they chose to investigate and the actual number of magi or wise men is is unknown Traditionally, it's, they're portrayed as there being three of them because there are three specific gifts that are mentioned being given to Jesus. We're not told in Scripture how it is that the Magi understood this star to be related to the birth of the Messiah. It's generally understood that right up until this time, many people were anticipating the Messiah's coming. So perhaps the Magi, with their practice of studying the stars and the availability of the Old Testament prophecies, they perceived this star was indeed for that purpose. Perhaps God divinely spoke to them and said what it's for. We we don't really know, but the main thing to understand is, is they were paying attention. They were watching. And then they searched. We talk a lot about how busy life is today. And it is incredibly busy. And I can't tell you how many times we have talked about it in the church that our busyness is interfering with our, our life, our experience with God. And yet, are we doing anything at all about the busyness? Or do we just keep right on rocking on? It's one thing to say, I am searching for the truth, but it's another thing to actually pause in your life to actually search for it. Not living your life in the fast lane expecting God to hit you upside the head with the truth one day. They were searching, they were watching, they were paying attention. But they were not expecting to find this newborn king just in a common home. They were expecting more than likely that this newborn king would be surrounded by other royalty. That their three gifts would not be the only three gifts given to Jesus that day, but there would be a lot of gifts provided to this newborn king. But theirs were the only gifts. They were the only ones who came bearing a gift. What's important to note is that they came... They were searching for truth, and they chose to worship the newborn king, Jesus. Remember, Herod wanted to know. He pretended to want to know so that he could supposedly worship, but he really had evil intentions. These three came to worship the newborn king because they had a different attitude. They responded with worship. Which is really interesting to think when you consider the gifts they brought him. Why do we bring gifts to Jesus when he in fact is our gift at Christmas? But that's how they responded to him. I had to ask you this morning, are you disappointed? Have you been hurt? And perhaps you're not finding God to be who you thought he should be, or your experience with God is not what other people have described their experience with God. And so something's not making sense. There's a sense of disappointment, maybe even some discouragement in your life. The wise men 
didn't find what they anticipated, but they simply chose to worship Jesus for who he was. Hey, I've been disappointed. I've been discouraged. I've had setbacks. Most of them are by my own fault. But life sometimes has dealt me a a difficult hand to deal with. But the reality is, is God has always been who he is. He has always been creator God. He has always been redeemer God. He has always been my savior God. And I can worship him regardless of what life throws my way. That's what I ask of you this Christmas. Can you worship God? Even though things are not turning out the way you anticipated, can you simply worship him for who he is? See, it's rather interesting to contrast the difference of response between King Herod and the wise men. King Herod was threatened, and he took action. His threat, his his feelings of threat caused him to do some really horrible things. The wise men simply worshipped because they were looking for truth. And even the religious leaders, the ones who should have been there worshipping Jesus more than anybody... We're not even at the scene. They were simply involved in the religious practices of their days. Unaware that their Messiah had actually come. Herod was born rich. And history shows that he died poor. He lost all of his power at the end. Jesus was born poor, yet he was destined to die on the cross, and he is, and he remains to be the king still today. Remember Jesus' words himself, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. God gave these wise men a beacon of light, a heavenly compass, if you would, to guide their way to the truth. And God continues to point towards his incomparable gift, containing the depth of his riches. And he makes that life available to you today. How can you respond to such a gift? What is it that you should give to this newborn king this day? And I would ask you to consider four gifts that you could give to Jesus this day. First, to Jesus, I give my trust. Who is it you're trusting in? What is it you're placing your faith in? Do you you believe him to be truly the the son of God that that was born on Christmas Day? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you give him your trust? Second would be, I give to Jesus my first place. This is worship. Jesus said in Matthew 22, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This means that there's nothing or no one more important than he is. This means that while you sometimes think about something changing your life, or you're counting on someone coming in your life, or you're looking for that perfect mate or that perfect job or a promotion and so forth, while all of those are okay to think about, they should never ever be more important than God. He remains first place. In fact, Jesus tells us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He is the key. You start with him. Third gift would be I give my I give to Jesus my service. This is loving others. Jesus continued on. He said it in the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is where we give ourselves away. We make ourselves available. This doesn't mean we say yes to every person and or every need that comes into our lives. It means that we have a heart that's willing to be used in any time and any occasion that uh, that God calls for us. And so we prayerfully seek His wisdom in guiding us. In those moments where we have a heart is willing. Instead of a hand that's closed up on what we have, we have a heart that's willing to release everything that we have, knowing, knowing that that's how we honor our God. And then lastly, I give to Jesus my voice. 
This is your witness. This is your, your words, your testimony about him, sharing him. The psalmist writes, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among peoples. It's a fallacy that we would say, I'm going to live my life in such a way as where people can see Jesus in me and that will draw them to him. We are, we are commanded that we are to go. We are to, to speak of Jesus. We are to declare his name. We are to share our personal story with, with others. How we came to know the glory of Christmas. How our lives have been dramatically impacted. And the fact that their lives can be as well. Christmas wasn't just for us. Christmas wasn't just so that one time a year we would all come to church and celebrate the birth of our Savior. And we collectively come together and we call ourselves God's people and we're like the chosen ones. No, we're actually the ones who are sent out into the world to let other people know that they too have been chosen by God. And it is through the life of the church that Jesus wants to make his name famous among this world. Among all the nations, Scripture says. So it is our responsibility to not just merely gather as a family or as a church corporate to celebrate Christmas, but it's our responsibility to take Christmas out and celebrate it as we share the love of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. God has come. The glory of God among us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that our hearts are capturing the true essence of your glory and that you have chosen in your incredibly sovereign way, you have chosen to come to this earth humbly being born to live among us and at just the right time died for us. And so Father, to celebrate your birth is also to remind ourselves of your death. The cross. very clear evidence of the spiritual battle that exists still today but we're also reminded of the resurrection that you prove your power over sin and death and by doing so you have made a way possible by which we can be redeemed we can be in a right relationship with our creator God We don't have to stumble our way through life. We don't even have to, why I hope I'm saved attitude. We can know. For your word even says, for I've written these things so you would know that you are saved. We can have assurance that Jesus is our Savior. And I pray, Father, for each and every heart in this room if there's not an uncertainty of that that this would be the day they would choose to give their heart as their gift to you this day to trust and believe in you your life, death, and resurrection there's nothing that we can do in our own lives to make this happen but you have done it for us but our responsibility is to receive the truth of your gospel message and in turn giving to you our very lives as Jesus himself said deny ourselves oh father may it happen this day and for those of us who've known Jesus for many many years now perhaps there's a need for us to remind ourselves why we chose to love Jesus in the first place and to choose to live for him this Christmas the glory of Christmas would shine not just through our life but through our words as we speak of you as well I pray it to be so in Jesus name Amen would you stand this morning as we sing this is a time of invitation for you to respond to 
God.